Great. Well, um, I'd like to thank uh, thank everyone for joining today, and uh, firstly, good afternoon, um, and welcome to today's session on securing remote workers uh, with Cisco Umbrella. Uh, my name is Mark Waldmeyer, um, and I work for Oryx Align. Uh, we're a London-based IT service provider. Um, we're also a Cisco Premium partner, and uh, we've been using Cisco Umbrella for quite a few years uh, so far. Um, I'm joined today by uh, Ishan Karatane uh, from Cisco. Uh, hey, hey everyone. Uh, indeed, thanks, Mark. Uh, hi, I'm Ishan, and I'm a technical solution specialist um, uh, within cloud security at Cisco. Perfect. Thanks. Um, so. Just some uh, introductions and uh, formalities. So essentially this webinar um, is gonna be made up of two sections. Um, and I'd ask that if you do have any questions, um, you know, just uh, just put them in the chat section and uh, we'll make sure we have enough time left uh, for a, a quick uh, Q&A session at the end. And uh, let's get started. So as we all know, uh, Basically, the, the current home working situation has meant that uh, a number of companies have been forced um, by the pandemic to embrace remote, re remote uh, working without much uh, sort of planning or, or risk assessment, um, as we'd normally see them do uh, if they were considering allowing the workforce to, to sort of work from home. Um, in many cases, we could see this causing a permanent shift uh, towards, towards home working, um, with many users uh, not wanting to return to the office uh, at all or continue working from home for the foreseeable future. Um, Twitter's recently announced that uh, they are, are sort of uh, allowing users to work from home forever, should they, should they need to. Um, and Google and Facebook have also um, come out and said that that is uh, their situation until the end of the year. Um, users have found themselves with incredibly limited time while working from home. Um, and as we all know, they are balancing uh, work commitments with uh, general home pressures. Um, this means that when they are online, uh, they expect IT systems to function just as well as they would have in the office. One of the trends we've seen at Oryx Align recently is an increase in clients regard, uh, requiring digital transformation projects, um, as, as well as wherever possible trying to leverage uh, modern technology to adapt to the, the, the current situation and wherever possible secure the users. Uh, there have, of course, been many benefits uh, brought on by the current situation, um, such as an increase in productivity, uh, collaboration through video chat, and for me personally, less commuting. There have, however, been a few major drawbacks. Although most companies have managed to be agile, um, they have lost a lot of the prior planned resilience and cybersecurity they may have had previously in, in their corporate networks. Attackers are always looking for ways to exploit vulnerable situations, and this has provided the perfect landscape for an exponential increase in several different types of cyber attacks. A new cyber attack worth mentioning is fairware, where cyber attackers are exploiting the fear of the coronavirus to cause the victim to fall prey to cyber attacks uh, and directing end users to false news sites containing malicious content. This has not been helped by the new, large, and sometimes undefined attack surface many IT teams are currently attempting to secure. Many companies have already invested heavily in per uh, perimeter security uh, and costly systems to secure the end users in the office. However, working from home, many users are no longer protected by these systems. IT teams are also more concerned with keeping end users productive outside of the office and immediate cybersecurity requirements are often overlooked or outdated. In fact, 78% of organizations believe remote workers are the most vulnerable to attacks. Actually, guys, I actually um, have one to kind of bag this up as well. Um, there's a recent stat that we have done by um, one of our um, researchers, ESG, who actually said 68% of those branch offices and roaming users were the source of compromise within those attacks. Perfect. Yeah, that's um, that's that's sort of a, a result of the um, you know, the unsecure and personal end user devices that are being used. Um, often these are shared between multiple individuals um, when multiple uses, such as uh, homeschooling um, as well as personal use. Um, at this stage, many corporate devices have also not checked in with the domain for some time and may be missing important security updates um, or settings. And if a secure VPN has been provided, usually users will avoid trying to connect to it um, if they can still perform the bulk of their work uh, without doing so. Uh, home networks and Wi-Fi also pose an additional risk. Uh, with bandwidth being constrained, many users are using hot, uh, 4G hotspots. Uh, uh, which will also be unsecure.
So what is DNS um, and DNS layer security? Uh, DNS or domain name system um, can be thought of as a phone book of the internet. Uh, it enables you to easily remember a web address um, instead of an IP address for your website, uh, which you're trying to access. Essentially, it forms a foundation of the internet as we know it, uh, and without it, we would be a little bit stuck. Um, DNS by itself is not secure. Um, you, you, you may not know your current DNS server. Um, it, it could be one that's provided from your um, ISP. Um, and as such, its only function is to ensure that it matches up your domain name that you're requesting with an IP address in its directory. If it doesn't know, it'll forward your request to another DNS server uh, and so on until it finds that address. At no point in that is it actually doing any, any uh, security or checking on that uh, name or IP address. So a question to pose to the audience is, would you notice when you're dialing a number on your mobile phone if the name was slightly wrong or the number incorrect? So DNS layer security, uh, cyber, cyber criminals use DNS just as we all do to connect to their infrastructure. Unfortunately, this is used to manage the cyber attacks. For example, uh, on the diagram in front, um, command and control servers. Many times these exploits are invisible to the end users, so they may have no idea that this uh, communication is happening. DNS layer security identifies where these domains and other internet infrastructure are staged and blocks them at the initial request. If it stops malware earlier and prevents callbacks if attackers are infected uh, or on infected machines if they connect into your network, uh, whereas traditional security systems would wait until malware uh, is detected and then they would act and uh, try and prevent it. Uh, DNS queries uh, are required for almost all web traffic and they're not dependent on a specific protocol or port. Um, this makes it the perfect place to enforce security uh, as it'll stop threats before they ev ever reach uh, the network or the endpoints. Um, at this stage, I'd like to hand over to uh, Ishan, uh, who can give us uh, an overview of the Cisco Umbrella uh, platform and how this can help. Thanks, Mark. And uh, actually, thank you to um, you guys, Oryx and Line, for having me on today, um, just to kind of run through Umbrella. Um, thank you all for joining um, you know, today's webinar. And actually, hopefully, I'll be able to, to kind of show you um, what Umbrella is and, um, and kind of where, you know, where we've come from in general. Um, but Umbrella, if, if just for a little bit of an overview, um, came from the OpenDNS acquisition. So OpenDNS, if uh, any of you are familiar today, um, was looking at how how do we, you know, how how could they provide, you know, a, a free, reliable, recursive uh, DNS solution? You know, just being a DNS um, recursive uh, provider, um, and they started that off in 2006. Um, you know, very much to to kind of improve the resiliency and the speeds around kind of the around DNS kind of requests, uh, especially at that time. And essentially, you know, OpenDNS ran with that for many years, and they, um, you know, they they put data centers around the globe. And and the one thing um, that they did is they ran with it for many years until about 2013, in which they said, actually, you know, look, if we apply a little bit of threat intelligence at this level, um, you know, we can see that, you know, the domains that we're getting requesting, you know, some of them are malicious. And in that sense, you know, why are we returning back the IP address um, to that specific user? Um, so that at that time, OpenDNS started a solution called Umbrella. And, um, and essentially two years later, uh, Cisco came along as they always do and said, Said, yeah, we really like what you guys are doing, and they acquired OpenDNS. Um, what Cisco has done since, or what we've done since, is that actually um, Cisco have come in completely, you know, uh, changed design and the feel and, and, and integrated it in with Cisco devices. The key core concept still remains the same. Um, but, you know, where, what Cisco has done and where we look to go to in the future is really exciting and bright as well. Um, so, you know, go, going ahead towards where we look to go within umbrellas is, is really good to see too. But of course, you know, just to kind of give you a little bit of an overview um, or just to kind of paint the picture as such, you know, the way, um, you know, we work has changed in the sense that obviously what Mark was saying, you know, we, uh, especially in today's kind of, you know, climate, we're all sat at home, um, you know, for example, I'm sat here at my, you know, my dining room table and, uh, and essentially, you know, we've seen this and it's not just something, you know, we've seen happen, you know, recently, you know, okay, I suppose it's very, you know, rapidly that's happened recently, but more of the, you know, over the past like 10 years, we've seen a lot of change in terms of the way IT is 
is being done in general. You know, we are no longer in offices, um, you know, protected by our guards and more, you know, critical infrastructure, those business apps and workplace desktop, desktops were all kind of protected, you know, on, uh, you know, behind your perimeter as such. But of course, you know, what's happened over time is, is that perimeter's branched outwards, you know, no longer do we have critical infrastructure sat behind our guards and, you know, in our guards and more, it is, you know, it is out in the cloud, it lives in, in AWS, Azure, um, and, and in GCP, et cetera, you know, those, that, that kind of critical infrastructure may be out there in the cloud. But of course, with that and to build on that, you know, business apps, um, you know, those applications that you used to host on site are now, you know, obviously in the cloud as well. Salesforce, Office 365 and G Suite, they have all been pushed out there too to obviously then aid um, and what's kind of come with that of course is you know device users and devices that are now roaming, you know, they're no longer there's a need for, for a user to come into an office where if they have their laptop, they could be sat anywhere, you know, at home or in, um, you know, in a coffee shop, for example, using those business apps, um, you know, that, that as for example, like 365. And then, of course, with that, with the shift as well, we've seen a lot of branch offices move away from, you know, the traditional direct internet access, I'm sorry, the traditional kind of lease um, line or the kind of, you know, um, dedicated lines as such coming back into their office, uh, back into HQ. We've seen actually a lot of branch offices uh, move to DIA. That's what I went to say. They've all kind of began their shift to look towards direct internet access, you know, reducing some of those costs. Why should we bring everything back to our HQ if our users are only going to access Office 365? And in that sense, you know, because everything else has moved outwards, we need to look at how do we protect these users and devices now? You know, where they may be out and about roaming or sat in a branch office, how do we ensure? that you know they are kept safe whilst roaming so just to kind of uh, just to kind of you know paint the picture and just you know give you an idea of where does umbrella fit well essentially umbrella is all about as you know we were just saying you know how do we secure that user and device regardless of where it may be around the world you know as i was saying regardless of whether a user sat on you know sat in um, our hq in our offices or whether they're sat you know as i say sat at home or in airports or in coffee shops or on the move that type of thing how can we ensure that obviously when they go out to the internet they they're not going to request anything that's um, that's malicious. If the device is infected, of course, you know, not going to request anything, uh, not going to request any domains associated with um, command and control callbacks. Um, of course, you know, example of there is around ransomware. But as well as that, you know, phishing, how can we look to pre prevent um, and protect our users against those phishing domains should they browse to one? So just to give you a bit of an idea of how this actually works, well, Umbrella will actually look at the requests on the device and it will look at it from two standpoints, but any three things can occur. So those two standpoints being security and your content filtering or the business policies that have been set within the dashboard. And the three things that have happened, of course, are is that could the request could be allowed, uh, the, the request could be blocked, or actually we send it to our intelligent or selective proxy. So, for example, you know, we request a domain that is uh, we, we've de determined as safe and actually it is, um, you know, allowed by your corporate policies. Then the one thing we will do, we will look at that and say, yeah, absolutely fine. We will return an IP address back to the user and the user can continue on through. If, say, for example, um, you know, that's a malicious domain, it's associated with certain attacks um, or actually, you know, it's blocked by your corporate policy. In that sense, what we will do is, is we will return the IP address of, what our, of one of our block pages. Essentially here, it could be one of yours where you've customised it, of course, as well. And then we have the middle option. So within Umbrella, if Umbrella or OpenDNS is a little uh, unsure around our threat intelligence, or actually Cisco Talos, which I'll touch on in just a little minute, um, is a little unsure as well. Or actually it's something we deem as risky or grey listed, something as a domain that we need to get further inspection on. Um, examples are like, you know, um, user uploaded content in terms of like blog pages. You know, in that sense, what we want to do is ensure that it's safe for the user and actually meets corporate policies. So in that sense, what we will do is we return the IP address of one of our cloud hosted proxies um, or actually the, the as I should say, the intelligent or that selective proxy. We make the decision, obviously, when the user comes to us to say, OK, yes, do you want to, you know, we will allow you through. That's fine. No worries at all. Or no, we will return a block page in that instance. 
I think the other key one that we want to look at is providing you as administrators visibility into all of your devices. You know, Mark, as we, we were just talking about those stats of, you know, um, laptops and, and clients getting, um, you know, getting infected whilst off network. You know, the one thing that we need to do is still get visibility into what they are up to. Those users and devices, you know, regardless of whether they are on or off network, we need to have a look and ensure um, that they aren't, you know, requesting anything malicious or actually if the device is infected just to give us some rough idea you know rough idea or to give us a heads up to say okay you know these are the requests that we are seeing and this is all associated with command and control for example um you know okay you as administrators can say right we have seen this it is now to take um action in which that we may say to the user your device is infected we need to take a look at it from it from an it standpoint just in terms of some of the threat intelligence, obviously the one thing that we that um, that I thought we'd touch on is actually, you know, how do we maintain this? Well, essentially, you know, Umbrella or the Open DNS um, resolvers around the globe will see in the rounds of 180 to 200 billion DNS requests a day. What we will do with that is we run those through various algorithms. We'll utilize AI in the sense that actually we will look at these domains and say, okay, you know, uh, we you know we will continuously ensure that they are safe um, and they are categorized correctly you know what we're not going to do is to say yeah that's fine that's safe and leave it as that um, you know the one thing that we want to do is that when you you know when your users or when you you know when you request a domain we want to make sure that that is safe um, for you for you to use but as well as this and utilizing models we have within Umbrella, we also, we also leverage and we also feed back into Cisco Talos. So if any of you are familiar, Cisco Talos is um, Cisco's big threat intel and research arm. It's actually the, uh, it's actually um, the largest non-governmental um, threat research and intel arm for, for, for cybersecurity. And essentially what that means is, is we take all of the data that all Cisco security devices may see. So if we take the example of of like an, an email security appliance uh, or you know so, uh, somewhere in the wild saying actually this is a new campaign we're detecting um, as such you know all of that intelligence gets fed back to all Cisco security devices and we pull that into umbrella to say okay you know within that email there was a phishing link we're going to bring it in to look at blocking it as well but of course as well as that we give back to all Cisco security devices as well you know all of our DNS data and all of the the kind of the, the things that we do go back into talent as well but as well as this obviously we've spoken about the models that we that are that obviously that we do within umbrella but as well as that of course you know cisco talos has and, and umbrella i should say have security researchers there that will look into things and and actually you know look into that one percent that hasn't been detected by you know that those automation side of things or those really complex um kind of threats that we see within the world but obviously i've spoken about some of the threat intel you know actually to kind of put this into a little bit of a into perspective for you guys um av test who is a third party um who do third party testing um they're based within germany um tested cisco umbrella against a number of our um, a number of our uh, um, competitors or actually a number of solutions within the market and actually we came up first in terms of threat detection we came out um you know first in both dns uh, side of things and the six side of things but especially around the DNS side, it's awesome that we get to see that, you know, it's really just proof that the models that we use around, um, you know, detecting these domains and detecting what's malicious, um, especially before day zero, is exactly what we want to see. But yeah, have a look at that report just to kind of, it will highlight and show you obviously what they picked up within those tests. That's it from kind of the slideware perspective. I have got a brief product demo to show you actually. I have a dashboard loaded. Um, what I'll do is, is I'll just refresh the screen for us. But essentially, I will just briefly run through here. Actually, what does a dashboard look like? Just to give you a little bit of a feel um, for what Umbrella looks like. So essentially, when you load the dashboard, you'll be presented with the overview page. Essentially here, understanding, okay, what has Umbrella done today? What are we seeing today as well? Um, and anything to alert us to. So here, right at the top there, what are we seeing in terms of requests that have been blocked just very quickly within Umbrella? The top will also display any notifications we may have around, um, you know, updates or new features added into the dashboard. But then scrolling down, we'll get an idea of our deployment health. So actually, what are we seeing in terms of active networks, active roaming clients and virtual appliances? 
don't worry too much in terms of deployment. I will I'll kind of highlight a little bit of it to you, but uh, but what we'll do is we'll cover that off at another stage. Um, but then scrolling down, of course, what do we see in terms of network request breakdown? So here, total number of DNS requests, and of course, you can delve in at any given point. Um, I'll highlight this in just a minute, but obviously, this will pivot us to activity details. Um, but here, of course, understanding what are we seeing in terms of the total number of requests? What has been sent to that intelligent or selective proxy in that sense? And then, of course, you know, what is the total blocks and umbrella has done today, both security and content filtering? And then here, of course, security blocks, what has umbrella prevented in that sense? Now, this graph here is broken down into four further categories. So if you scroll down a little bit more, you'll see blocks by security category. And here, obviously, you'll see uh, malware. What are we seeing today? Uh, phishing as well. Uh, command and control. And of course, crypto mining, the main four that we see, um, you know, users or actually administrators wanting to keep an eye on, um, you know, malware and phishing, of course, are yes, critical. The command and control, though, is extremely critical to watch out for. If you're seeing command and control traffic on a network, it means that a device is infected and therefore we need to look at remediation. So absolutely, in all three aspects, we want to make sure that these graphs are low. Um, but, you know, for example, if I said, actually, we've seen a massive spike here, um, you know, at 12 p.m. on one of the days, if we click on that graph, as I was saying, it will pivot us into activity search, which I'll kind of come into in a little bit more detail in just a couple of minutes. But here, of course, immediately we can say, OK, we have a roaming identity, a machine identity um, that has made a request. Um, we have their external IP address. The action that was took that, of course, was blocked by Umbrella, the categories it fits into, and of course, date and time stamped. But actually, if we just move back a little bit, we also have an AD identity. So of course, we can integrate an Active Directory with into Umbrella, and here we can see that Amber has requested this domain, and again, this was blocked under command and control. But of course, here we have our internal and external IP addresses for, for us, of course, to do some research into. But just jumping back to that overview page, you'll see, um, you know, command and control was just one of the examples that you can pivot into. Of course, you know, crypto mining is still another one that we see on the rise. It may be of interest there too. App discovery and control is all about then, okay, what are the applications that your users are using? And actually, do you permit your users to use those applications as an IT team? Um, you know, app discovery is all about how do we combat against the shadow IT side of things? You know, how can we ensure that, okay, you know, your users are adhering to corporate, um, corporately sanctioned applications and, you know, your data isn't going, um, uh, going to be stored in other, you know, in other, for example, other cloud storage applications or, your, you know, that your users aren't using other applications that you may not approve of. So app discovery and control here just shows, you know, what are the applications we're seeing today? But Umbrella, of course, will risk score them here for you. So actually I'm determining, OK, what are those flagged applications or those flagged categories here? And then, of course, what are those flagged applications? So here we have um, a couple of applications marked as very high and we'll delve into this report in just a couple of minutes as well. And then just towards the bottom, what are we seeing in terms of most block security requests? So by destination, we have a number of, uh, of requests that we're seeing that have been, um, you know, have been blocked quite a lot. And it's actually one thing um, that is really useful to administrators. If you're seeing a lot of block requests within the dashboard, it means that something's not right. And therefore, you should look at, you know, understanding or taking action if necessary. So here, you know, just to give you an example there, that 193 request has quite Quite a lot there, um, you know, looks suspicious in general. That looks like it's a, a DGA, uh, a domain generated, you know, a, a domain generated by um, uh, by an algorithm as such. It looks like a DGA domain. But actually, if you look closer or research that, you'll realize that is um, one of the WannaCry domains. Um, that is just as an example in this lab domain. But here, of course, we've got 193 block requests for it. It shows that something's not quite right. We may want to investigate that into further detail. The same is by identity. OK, understanding, you know, which of the identities are actually which of your roaming clients or or AD users or mobile devices have produced a lot of uh, a lot of block requests, again, giving us further information. And then by type as well. What are we seeing in terms of the blocks done by um, security in the, in the DNS side of things? But as well as that, you may see a couple of other types as well. So within Umbrella, if a user comes through to that intelligent or selective proxy, the one thing that we will do 
is we will scan those files if they should they download any. So if a user initiates a file download and it comes through to that intelligent proxy, the one thing that we will do is we will scan it using Cisco AMP. Um, Cisco AMP is actually one of Cisco's other um, solutions, essentially looking at um, scanning or, or looking at the advanced malware protection side of things within files uh, as such within Cisco. And actually we leverage that within Umbrella to do file scanning for you. But just to give you a little bit of an idea with some of the reporting, um, of course, if we're coming to reporting and security activity, security activities are, is just a very quick way, a high level understanding, OK, what has been blocked by Umbrella and in for in this example, in the last 24 hours that we, we that we filtered by. So here, of course, we can just scroll down and here actually we've seen, our, you know, our, our WannaCry domain. We can say here, actually, this is the destination um, that this idea identity was going to but also let's just understand if there was any other requests and of course just flicking through some of the requests we can see actually there's an, there's another AD identity but also as well as that we have their AD computer as well um, that has made that request so just to give an example of just high level how can we just briefly get a, a, a quick view but of course, as well as that, we can come into activity search. So where we want to get most granular with this data, this is the report for it. So activity search, as I was saying, is all about how do we look at what is being requested within Umbrella itself. So here, actually, if I toggle the menu way on the left hand side, we can understand and say, OK, we've got a number of AD users who are producing these requests, the internal and external IP addresses, the action that Umbrella took, because of course this is all traffic from Umbrella, um, the categories that we've seen, uh, the category, sorry, they fit into, and the date and timestamp there for you. So here, of course, we can scroll down just very quickly, high level, understanding, okay, you know, what, what are the identities that we're seeing within the dashboard? Of course, you know, what we can do is, is we can begin to say, right, there's certain people I want to delve into. And here in search request activity, I can say, actually, there's a user identity called Marcus. And actually, I want to understand and review what Marcus has been up to. And here, of course, we can select, we can click on his name. This will be all of his traffic, but of course, I'm only interested in what's been blocked for today. So here, Marcus, this is, of course, I filtered by him. The response was blocked. I could go further on the left hand side. I could filter by security categories or content categories. But actually, because of my policies, I've set actually there's a number of things I wanted to block against. We see that actually these are the domains of what he's been up to, uh, of he, that he's been accessing internal and external IP addresses. The action that umbrella took, the categories they fit into, and date and timestamp there for you. What we could do is, is we could actually just say filter by everything that's been blocked. So obviously, you know, once we've taken a look at Marcus's traffic, I should have said we could download that report um, if you if we wanted to. But actually, let's just filter by blocks for now, and actually let's filter by just security categories we're not too worried about some of the content categories for now but here of course we've got a number of identities we can see the destinations that they've been, they've been off to the external ip address the action that umbrella took and of course the categories they fit into so we see we've got a number of mal, uh, malware domains spotted here um, or malware requests and of course you know there's uh, we also have further categories to aid in this so potentially harmful is where we take a more stringent more stricter security posture by allowing that uh, by basically blocking any domains we deem as potentially harmful but of course you know you have the ability to look into the dashboard and here see when those requests were made we'll just move over of course to one of the other reports so app discovery this is the one that i was uh, we were just talking about uh, uh, about a couple of minutes ago around what are the applications that our users are using and do we permit our users using those applications so here you know you saw those flagged apps on the front um if we take finality um for this example um you know let's just take this as an app that we have within our dashboard um, actually, you know, here we can actually get some further information. So here, this one's looking at providing cloud-based VoIP and unified communication solutions. So actually, this makes sense as a, as um, you know, as, as an app we may see on on our, our you know used by our our, um, our users. But here, of course, we can delve into its into risks. So here, for example, within this app, actually, you know, we can say the business risks has been identified as high within Umbrella. Um, it's just to say, look, have a 
have a do some research into this. And actually here for this app, we can see that this has an elevated risk um, because of financial viability. So actually, if we just look through some of the graphs, the usage type, it says it's on a corporate basis. It just has marked that on the top of the scale for higher risks, just to say, look, be wary. It's because it's being used in a corporate environment. We know that attackers are going to specifically look at those applications because they know corporate users will, like, will use them. What are we seeing in terms of web reputation? That's done by Talos. But in this example, the reason why this has been marked as high is because the financial viability risk done by a third party has actually said this is really high. And actually, it may be something that you know we may need to, inve to investigate into uh, in a little bit more detail. That's just an example there. If I jump back to app discovery and I pick on another application, just to give you another reason why we may flag something as high, is actually Convertio. Uh, Convertio here is a, um, as it will say, hopefully once loaded, um, that it is a, conver uh, a conversion uh, tool. There it is, provides tool to convert any files to any format. And actually, we've marked it as high, but here the media, the business risk is medium. So actually here, again, it's used on a more corporate basis, just says be a little bit wary. Our web reputation actually has said that this is used, this is actually more on the good to neutral side, so not too much to worry about there. We haven't got much on in terms of our financial viability risk done by the third party. Of course, they haven't got much information. But actually, the one reason why this is flagged is because it says it's a file conversion app. And to go alongside that, we can see that the way that data is stored um, is actually is that it's unstructured. Of course, naturally, if it's a file conversion app, you know, we're not too sure where that data is going off to in terms of the servers that it may use to convert those files. So here, of course, we said it's unstructured, which, of course, carries that higher risk. Here, just to delve into some of the other aspects here, what are we seeing in terms of usage risk for this application, and is that right? But also vendor compliance, you know, should you have to meet certain uh, certifications or compliances and want to understand whether certain apps are compliant, here in the dashboard it's a really easy way of seeing that. So 27, ISO 27001 or PCI DSS, just as, an, just as a couple of examples there, you know, is this specific application compliant? And if it is awesome, if not, okay, we just need to understand and whether it is applicable to these apps too. But scrolling out to the top, you can say, okay, we want to understand you know, this application a little bit better. Here, of course, we can say, okay, here are the identities that have requested this specific application. And in this sense, we've got a number of them. We've got a handful of, of, of identities that have made these requests. Actually, when do we first detect that the use of the application? When do we last detect it? Of course, are specified within the dashboard. But of course, you know, you can have a conversation with these users. It could be to say, okay, you shouldn't use this application. We have something else. Or actually, you know, sorry guys, is this something that we have missed from an IT perspective? So it's a good, useful report just to understand, you know, what apps your users may be using. Using. But of course, you know, if you say uh, and you have the conversation to say, look, you shouldn't be using this application. The one thing that you can do is in the dashboard is you could say, look, we want to block against this application. So here, of course, we could then say block this specific app under a certain policy and we can label the application as not approved. So just to show you where that not approved comes from here, obviously managed by your IT teams, if you wanted to, the apps discovered here, these the number of unreviewed apps obviously is, is obviously what the, the new ones within your environment, what's under audit by your IT teams, uh, what's not approved and therefore blocked with an umbrella and therefore what is approved within uh, within the, you know, the corporation as well or the organization. So here, obviously, it gives your IT teams a little bit of flexibility to, to easily manage these apps should you want to. I think the last raw report just to run through is um, some of the threat side of things. So actually, this is a brand new report that we have within Umbrella. It's actually in what's known as our Threat Lens Beta Program, but it should fair it should be coming out fairly soon. But essentially, this kind of contextualizes the information we've seen in some of the reports. You know, where we've seen some of those malicious requests. If you wanted to very quickly understand, okay, what do those what do those domains map to in terms of threats, or actually? What are the threats that we see that we have blocked within Umbrella or we're seeing within Umbrella? This is where we get a breakdown. So here, of course, we just get a bit of a graph just to understand, okay, what are the different types of, of threats that we're seeing? What is the impact? What are those identities that we're seeing there? And those top malicious domains that we've seen within, the, within your organization as well. Newly seen domains, of course, is a category that we have within Umbrella when you build out your policies as another most stringent kind of security setting. So as I was saying, you know, in activity, you know, research, 
we could set more stricter policies to say potentially harmful domains or newly seen domains we want to block with an umbrella if your organization says look we just want to make sure that these are safe before any of our users go to it you know there are policies that you can set to specify that newly seen domains in this example here will just show you anything that umbrella has seen that's newly seen that your organization has been requesting as well but just as an example, you know, if we take our ransomware, um, you know, example, you know, as I pointed out, that domain was associated with WannaCry. Here, of course, we can understand those 22 requests. What are the most active identity types for this specific threat? And of course, you can it will pivot you back into activity search to show you specifically what they are. Um, but here, of course, the threats associated, we get an idea to say, actually, this is WannaCry. Um, and of course, actually, we have just a little bit of unclassified ransomware within the reports as well. And of course, just those most uh, direct active destinations for ransomware, that top one there is displayed on the screen for you. As I was saying, you know, that domain is associated um, with WannaCry. So there's just some of the reports that you can get within Umbrella. Um, here, of course, on the left hand side, what are we seeing in terms of like there are a number of additional reports, you know, should you wish to use them, you could say what well, I wanted to know what my activity volume is for certain DNS requests or understand what my top destinations and categories are. There are things that can be displayed within the dashboard. Just to give you an example of some of the management side of things that you can do, you can of course export any of these reports. So actually, if we come into activity, come into activity, if activity search, sorry, I could come up to the top here and search by Marcus, and I can say actually Marcus for everything that's been blocked. You know, I want to hit apply, and actually this is all of his traffic. I can hit the download button there, and it will download me, and it will export it as a as a CSV. I can also have the report scheduled to me as well. So should you want to schedule these reports, whatever you put in your filters on the left hand side, get pulled into these scheduled reports. So here, of course, I've typed in Marcus as uh, seen here. My response is I want everything that's been blocked and I can hit continue and it will ask me to say, OK, when would you like this report sent to you on a daily, weekly, monthly basis? Just to understand, um, uh, you know, what that traffic is or should you want to get a report every day or every week or every month as such. Um, I thought it may be very useful just to highlight two other things. Um, actually, if, if any of you have um, larger um, kind of organizations where you all may have kind of seam tools or SOC teams, um, you know, where you have kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of centralized logging as such, the one thing that you can do is you can export all of the logs out of Umbrella into your seam or your SOC tools to provide, you know, further, um, you know, further uh, uh, detail as such or further logs to kind of help with investigations if you have them as such. Investigate kind of builds on that. So investigate here is where we give you access into our threat intelligence. So here, of course, you know, what are we seeing in terms of the, um, you know, what, what can we see in terms of the, the domain that's being requested, you know, the, the full URL. You can have a look behind the ASN in that sense, the autonomous system number. You could throw in an IP address there. What will you have on certain ha uh, file hashes? So you could throw in a 256 um, or SHA 256, sorry, or actually an email address associated with a domain. So the example that I bring up is binary, oh, if I spell that right, um, binarycousins.com. Now, binarycousins.com was actually a domain associated with the ransomware attack known as Loki a good number of years ago. A couple of months ago, this actually was marked as being blocked. But because, you know, Loki doesn't really exist anymore, this domain is pretty much nothing. It's benign. It doesn't have anything on there. Binary Cousins here, we've actually reduced its risk to 26. Uh, here, of course, you know, this a couple of months ago would have said blocked under security categories for ransomware or command and control. And actually, this was, and it would have said this is due to the ransomware attack known as Loki. But of course, just to show, show you this, what do we see in terms of its security indicators? But just to go back in showing you what I mean around we constantly analyze these domains. Well, here in the timeline, I can show you that actually back when this domain was registered, which was, you know, quite a while back here on the 5th of August 2014, we saw changes in MX records. And then a little bit later, we begin to see changes in the A record there and then begin to see changes in the NS record there as well. Oh, 
it's a little bit later on. You can see here it is, BNS records. But of course, you know, we can get an idea to say, actually, come the 10th of August, we can see that malware has been added. And from that long period of time for those number of years, we've seen that actually this is the data that's been, you know, that has been requested. But say, for example, we take, you know, just as a little bit of an example here, the 20th of May, so this was yesterday at three o'clock in the afternoon, we're still seeing 14,000 requests for this, for this specific domain. Excuse me. Um, and here, of course, you know, we can see that actually something in the world is still requesting this, um, which is oddly strange because this ransomware attack isn't really, you know, Loki isn't really much about anymore. But here, of course, DNS resolution, we could delve into those IPs, those name servers and re DNS records. But scrolling down, we get to get more information. So here, of course, actually, we can see that India is requesting 44% of this traffic. Um, kind of begins to paint a picture, but also helps you in security investigations and understanding, okay, this domain lives in this country, why is the majority of the traffic coming from a different country? So here, of course, in India, we see a lot of um, requests for this binarycousins.com. Scrolling down a little bit more, what are the files um, associated with this domain? So here, of course, what we've done is, is we've thrown these files through um, AMP Threat Grids, which is what we do on our side to provide you a little bit more intelligence around some of the file hashing or actually around some of the, inter the uh, identities of compromise or the indicator compromise, sorry. I can click on this SHA and actually if I come to the top tab here, I can click on that and it will say, okay, you know, this is investigate and show me those behavioral indicators. And then of course, fourth one down, Lockheed ransomware was detected and that's the reason why this has been brought up as a threat score of 100. There are, of course, you know, further features within Investigate, just to highlight what we do around this, you know, looking at the autonomous system number there, of course, and scoring that autonomous system number. The subdomains obviously all go under um, under inspection as well. Any co-occurrences, co-occurrences is where we have relationships between two domains. It could be like page redirects. And actually, it's where we see a domain being requested in quick succession. So actually, where you request binarycousins.com, you see another domain, you see a domain for another uh, um, a request for another domain either side of it you know almost 100 percent of the time so here of course we've got a we've got a number of co-occurrences displayed or just two co-occurrences displayed and then of course you know any other related domains with that within that as well we will investigate those and of course what this means is if any of those related or co domains or co-occurrences or subdomains are not malicious then you know the domain in its general that we're investigating is most likely going to be malicious as well so that's it in terms of kind of the investigate perspective and some of the reporting, but I thought I'd leave this to last, but actually just to give you guys a little bit of um, uh, an insight into what, if you wanted to look at this in, in, in kind of more detail and actually you said, um, you know, we wanted to look at trialing umbrella or actually you just wanted to understand, okay, what's the most basic form you could get in terms of un umbrella protection? Well, actually, if you come to the top and click on deployments and network devices, you can click on the button there and of course the one of the most easiest and simplest ways to like trial umbrella or just get a rough idea uh, of what umbrella can do you can come into the networks tab and hit the button and essentially what you want to do is just change your dns forwarders to point to umbrella tell us what your network name is or give your network a name and tell us what your public egress ip address is um, or the block as such and of course what that means is, is we can understand the traffic that's coming from your environment and look to apply a policy and give you reporting on that accordingly. In fact, actually, you could say, do you know what, I want to have a test of umbrella. You could basically set the policy to do nothing. But of course, you know, this is for kind of on network side for, you know, for some of you who wanted to test on your your network in general while your users away, it is one of the most easiest ways to do because all we're doing here is changing the DNS forwarders, um, you know, from your local domain, you know, from your local DCs, whatever they forward up to, as Mark was saying, maybe your ISPs, it may be Google, it may be whoever, you know, put them to umbrella. You know, the one thing that we would do, we will do is we will speed up those requests. Um, actually, you know, umbrella or open DNS is what is either the, is the um, it, we come in the top three in terms of our speed for DNS, um, uh, for kind of DNS uh, resolve speeds as such.
But of course, you know, some of you are going to say, well, all right, then that's on network protection. What do we do for our roaming clients? Well, actually, you can test that as well within a, within a trial. You can come over to roaming clients and you can download the, the, the sorry, roaming computers and you can download the client that it sits on the device very easily and simply. You can click on downloading the roaming client here. And of course, and we have standard Windows and Mac clients that you could use. Or if you're an AnyConnect customer, say, for example, you use AnyConnect in your organization, you found one of the most easiest and simplest methods to deploy. You could deploy the module with inside any connect. So what? Uh, so here, for example, you know when uh, you know when a user is off VPN and using any connect. The one thing that we can do, of course, is uh, is essentially say, okay, we're going to um, you look at protecting that DNS traffic or, or look at understanding those requests. It also comes in handy, of course, you know, in general when I use the roaming client. Actually, in general, where you may have split tunneling set up for your users. At this current period of time, if you've got a lot of users at the office, I think a lot of a lot of companies are reducing the amount of load our firewalls have to use, and therefore are looking at split tunneling. But that's just a couple of examples of what you could do here within the dashboard. Um, of course, I will end here. If you have any further questions, you know, get in touch with myself, get in touch uh, with the guys at Oryx Alignment, and you know, we can ha you know happily answer those questions for you. But of course, you know, put them in the chat. We have you know uh, uh, we have almost like ten minutes or so to go through some of the you know some of the questions. Um, but what I will do is now is I will pause, and uh, myself, Mark, uh, you know, on the call are here to answer any questions you may have. Have within uh, within the Q and A panel. So of course, you know, make sure that you post any questions that you may have, and myself and Mark will uh, we will uh, re respond to them as such. Thank you. That's great. Uh, thanks, Ishan, uh, Ishan, for uh, going through that. I find it really interesting, especially the um, umbrella investigate, which uh, is really helpful for. Um, for, for sort of uh, you know investigating those uh, those threats and, and that sort of thing. So absolutely. So yeah. So uh, as you mentioned, um, I think it'd be uh, it'd be great if we could uh, uh, sort of answer any of the questions that uh, may have come up through that. Um, it's uh, you know uh, uh, in in my opinion, it's it's quite a simple product, but uh, quite powerful. So um, yeah, if there's anything that we can uh, we can try and go through, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, I was just looking through the chat. We've got a number of questions here. Um, does it require any special hardware or software installation, such as appliance or server? Um, no, do you know what? No special hardware at all. Umbrella is, say, for example, we can help aid in hardware deployments. Should you have kind of Cisco devices on site, you know, we can integrate them in. We're not going to waste them, of course. You know, if you have, um, say, for example, any Meraki equipment or any, you know, um, uh, Victella or Cisco SD WAN deployments or, or actually you know um, any Cisco wireless LAN controllers we can easily integrate them in to deploy but saying that of course if you're not if you haven't got any Cisco devices or anything like that and you just say look um, we we are um, we're either totally cloud-based or actually we may we have the, the ability to like you know roll out like virtual appliances of course we have those methods of deployment too you know the one thing that we can do is put a client on the endpoint device and that you can secure your users that way we could use a virtual appliance and do it that way or actually if it's just the kind of basic protection and you're just more about kind of protecting the network for now rather than getting the granular identities actually the one thing that we can do is just use your existing dns dns infrastructure change your forwarders up to umbrella and of course you know we can begin to see those reports within the dashboard absolutely i've, I've always found that the um you know the easiest way to secure an environment is um is you know just just changing the dns it's quite quite straightforward and, and very simple so Absolutely. Um, and one of the uh, points on that I was just about to mention was uh, the documentation I found is, is great as well. So, um, you know, any, any of the sort of setup guides or how that fits into your existing environments, um, you know, there, there's a lot of documentation available, um, which, which goes through it in, in quite a bit of detail. So. I don't know. It does indeed. Thank you, Mark, for that. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that. It's one thing that we want to do within Umbrella. Umbrella is, um, you know, our motto since the Open DNS days are all about how can we create easy to deploy and simple to manage security solutions. And and our do documentation really goes hand in hand with that. We make it super easy for you all to understand how you deploy Umbrella. Um, but of course, as well as that, we provide you screenshots. You know, we show you step by step everything that you need to do. So no, thank you, Mark, for that.
I was just looking at some of the other questions that we're seeing within the chat. Um, how do you license Umbrella? Um, you know, the one thing it is for Umbrella is that it's just on a number of users, regardless of how many um, devices a, um, you know, they may have. Um, say, for example, that actually, you know, user has like a laptop and a desktop, or they may have like a laptop on an iPhone or, or an Android device or an iOS device, etc. You know, and you say, look, we want to protect all of these. Absolutely. It's just done on a number of users um, and, and in essentially you just kind of deploying that method. I think the la the other question that I was seeing, you know, go that goes kind of hand in that, you know, what happens if Umbrella goes down? Um, you know, what happens in that sense? Well, actually, um, it's such a really good question. Um, Umbrella uh, and our DNS resolvers, uh, especially our DNS resolvers, have had 100% uptime since 2006. If those wow. of you who are kind of interested in knowing how we do that, well, essentially, those two I Umbrella IP addresses that I kind of showed you briefly in the dashboard, the ones ending in, in two 220 and 222, um, they are based on an anycast um, um, uh, address as such. They are anycast IPs, which essentially means that actually you will be rerouted um, or you will be routed in general to your nearest data center, regardless of where you are around the world. So, you know, if you, you know, regardless of where your users are, depending on whether they are global or whether they're in specific countries, you will be redirected to a, a data center within those locations or the nearest one to them as such. As well as that, you know, if such a, should a data center go down or offline as such, you'll automatically, and those requests will automatically be rerouted to the nearest, to the next nearest data center or a data center that has lower load as such. So, you know, the one thing that we um, we pride ourselves is actually our DNS resolvers have had 100% uptime. And the one thing that we will look to do is, is, is to ensure that as well. Um, and of course, provide you those DNS, um, the speeds and reliability, regardless of where a user may be around the world. Um, these data centers are strategically placed in IXPs or internet exchange points to ensure the speed and reliability in that sense. So really good question there. No, that's uh, yeah, that's brilliant. Um, I'm not too sure if there's any more to go through, but uh, what I wanted to just say was um, obviously thank you, uh, Ishan, for your time today. Um, that was really, really great and uh, good to see the demo as well. Um, and obviously thanks for everyone who attended this as well. Um, and I hope you found this useful um, and a, a good insight into the Cisco Umbrella um, ecosystem and what it can actually do for you um, quite effectively and quite uh, quickly uh, for some of the remote users. So. Um, obviously, if you have any further detail, uh, any further questions uh, or require any further details um, on, on how to get this or a trial uh, set up, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, uh, I'll put the details on screen. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, obviously, uh, hoping you guys have uh, a great rest of the day. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for having me on, um, you know, and, and thank you for inviting me on to Oryx Alliance uh, um, webinars. That's great. Um, thanks a lot.